Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build with us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-host Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples. On today's episode, we have a prompt coming in from our Discord and patron member, Commissar Whiskers, who wants to introduce a new prompt to us. But before we get into that, remember that if you want us to build your world, You can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, and submit a link where we will build your world. If you want to follow us on social media, we're over at Let's World Build. If you want to become part of our Discord community, or if you're feeling particularly generous, you can always give us money over on Patreon with links to both of those in this very episode description. Enough of the shilling, onto the show. So, Commissar Whiskers has a prompt for us that reads, This is an organization build. The Postal Service in space, providing communication between far-flung reaches of space when regular radio or laser connections won't do. Questions. Can ships somehow travel faster than light so all communications are couriered? Is there a reason to ferry physical goods? And finally, there is no faster-than-light communication or it has severe limitations. So... We were talking about this previously. Daniel, I know that you have a lot to say about this in particular. So why don't you go ahead and start us off, give us a little prompt about FTL and then introduce one of your tenants. Yeah, I was going to say like, I, this is like one of my favorite things about sci-fi is the question of, of light speed. So I've got a little primer for us about the problems light speed and approaching light speed and exceeding it, um, presents to like sci-fi. So I want to take you down a little uh, sci-fi fast lane, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Can we start at Flash Gordon and then kind of go from there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, 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 the fictional problem with light speed is that space is really insanely fucking huge. Like, it's so mm-hmm. huge, we just care up our, our minds around how gigantic it is. And light speed itself, like, isn't fast enough for us to tell stories that can zip around the galaxy. Um, and so I want to, like, give a little sense of how big space is and how much light speed doesn't really get the job done first. Um, the sun's like 92 million miles away, right? If, if we were going to drive there in a car, how far, how fast do you, or how long do you think it would take to get there? What kind of car am I equipped with? <laughs> Tesla, the one that they shot into space, that Tesla, 65 miles an hour. 65 miles an hour? Oh God, yeah. eons is my guess. Mm, a very long time is what I would say. 160 years, okay? Mm. Hmm. So that's just to get to the sun and light. If you're traveling at light speed, that'd be like eight minutes. So, so that's, oh. that's, that's a small scale comparison, but now let's look at the, the bigger problem that the light speed presents is if you can travel at light speed, you face issues of what's called time dilation, mm-hmm. which basically means um, for you, time is passing slower relative to the person observing you who's not traveling at light speed. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. give like an example of that um, closest star away is about eight light years. Okay. And if I'm if I'm in my Tesla that now travels at light speed, it's going to take me 14 months to get there. Not not too long, but 14 months there and back, right? But on Earth, that means eight years passed. So oh, we we start to have this differential problem when you start going at light speed. You start to have problems with like time, you know, vast amounts of time passing, even though you're zipping around relatively quickly. So that's that's not even that far. That's eight light years. So the the, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, right? So if I'm going from Earth to the edge of the galaxy, how how quickly do you think I could do that in my light speed Tesla? Daniel, I did not make a podcast to be quizzed as though I'm back in school. So. <laughs> this is so much fun, though. I love this because it's mind-blowing. So if, if I'm on Earth, right, I'm going to go to the edge of the galaxy in my light speed Tesla. How long is it going to take me, not, on, not Earth, but how long is it going to take me to get to the edge? It would take you 28 years to get to the edge of the oh, galaxy. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Traveling at light speed. But on Earth, 50,000 years will have passed. Jesus. Uh, so that's okay. the huge problem. It's just light speed's not fast enough, and we have this issue with time dilation. So now the third problem, the biggest problem, is to get to light speed, we would, it would require infinite energy. Because mm-hmm. in order to accelerate mm-hmm. to light speed, it shouldn't technically be possible, because if you have mass, then it will require basically infinite energy to get there. Gotcha. Light is massless, so it automatically travels at light speed. So those are the three like problems with with light speed. So mm-hmm. when, when, what sci-fi tries to do is to solve that. Instead of trying to um, like just break the light speed barrier, all the solutions involve working around that problem. Because 
you know, part of what sci-fi is about is acknowledging the existing science and trying to work with it rather than just like violating it, which is what you do in magic in a, in a fantasy setting. You just kind mm-hmm. of throw that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just say that magic is the cause and the reason for it. Exactly. The reason so we've got to like find a way around it. Yeah, there's a reason I like fantasy more is because I can just don't have to do as much homework. And it's like, oh, geez, <laughs> I just can say magic did this and move on. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so w- what we end up doing in sci-fi is like either we work around the rule or we exploit something we don't know a lot about. And we just kind of like make up stuff from there or we find a gap like in the knowledge and we insert like an exploitation. Mm-hmm. Now, the other consequence of any of the solutions, and I'm going to talk about a few solutions that you see in sci-fi, um, is that they, and this this is something that generally sci-fi writers ignore, is that any of the solutions make time travel possible. If you can travel faster mm. than light, mm. you automatically can time travel. And that's just kind of a fact of the situation. Is it, what kind of time travel is it? Is it like forward only? Is it backward? Like, how does that work exactly? Both, because time is a dimension of space. So right. when you start warping space in the way that you would require to go faster than light or to be traveling faster than light, then mm-hmm. going backwards and forwards is the same thing. And now, mm-hmm. again, I'm not like a physics person. This is all based on layman reading. But generally, the consensus there is that if you're traveling faster than light or if you have the ability to do that, you can now time travel. Interesting. Okay. And we're yeah. going to be ignoring time travel here is my guess. Yeah. Cause I assume okay. we'll have to ignore that <laughs> yeah. because yeah. the sci-fi writers really haven't solved that. Okay. So the fun part, I've got five solutions that we generally see in sci-fi. Okay. Okay. Is First one of one, them from Futurama? Because I feel like that's technically vital. yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is the most, which is the best kind of correct. So yeah, absolutely. Continue on. The first one is, I think, the dumbest one because it's the laziest one. The first one just says change the rules of science itself. Mm. So so what that means is, like, if I can't okay. travel faster than light, I'll just change the speed limit to some value that makes sense for me. <laughs> <laughs> or, like with Hitchhiker's Guide, I've got this probability drive that changes the probability that I'm going to be improbability drive. Mm-hmm. Changes the improbability that I'll be someplace by changing the rule of probability. Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that's cheap because it's basically magic, in my opinion. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two, and this is the most popular one, you shrink the distance between two points. Mm-hmm. So that's what Star Trek does. They, the, the ship doesn't actually move. It shrinks the space between its destination and it. Mm. Mm-hmm. I saw that's that too in, um, what is it? The Long Way, or A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky oh, Chambers. Yeah. It's, um, it's like a sort of friendly like low-key crew type of story um and in it they the ship that they're on its purpose is basically to punch holes in space so that Mm -hmm. that travel can actually occur because otherwise it just wouldn't be able to that's cool that's exactly yeah that's what wormholes are in this category too so like Mm -hmm. babylon 5 you know uh the jump drive and Battlestar, they're Mm -hmm. all basically Mm -hmm. shrinking the distance to get places um problem with that one is the energy requirements are ridiculous like we're talking consuming a sun per jump or more seems um, reasonable <laughs> yeah so like basically yeah. controls the space yeah. um three is fewer sci-fis i've seen use this mass effect uses this is since particles that don't have mass automatically travel at the speed of light if you could change your mass to be negative or imaginary then you would automatically travel faster than light so tachyons mm-hmm. are particles that do this. Like they by default travel faster than light because they travel backwards in time. Oh my God. So in Mass Effect, they have a device that just changes their mass to be essentially imaginary. And so mm-hmm. they can travel faster than light. Now, uh, mm-hmm. problem with that is how, how the hell does that work? <laughs> and how do you survive that? I don't know. Is that Magic. is that why the games are called Mass Effect? I think so. I mean, I've never played them. So. <laughs> I, I, I haven't know. played them either. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, four is a favorite of star wars so that would be you take a shortcut through a different kind of space so you use hyperspace Mm -hmm. in this case or you use subspace like star trek uses subspace as a way to communicate faster than light um and there's a couple of explanations for either the space is some kind of other realm that has different rules or it's higher dimensional like in hyperspace tends to be a higher dimensional space so like traveling through it takes less time if there's less distance involved than in regular space or, and this is the weird one, and it's the case in Star Trek, the space serves as a, a, a absolute reference frame. So, like, we had the problem of time dilation because we've got different reference frames, like Earth 
and the traveler you know have have different reference frames to each other what this does is set up an absolute one so if you go into this space everyone's traveling at the same speed essentially or they have the same reference mm. frame mm. and so that's why it allows you know uh bypassing the whole relativity problem um, so we we did skip futurama and i do want to mention that one because i yeah. think it's it's pretty clever uh so the way that the ship works in uh futurama is that it doesn't move. It physically does not move. It literally mm. moves the universe around oh. it. <laughs> yeah, it's so, definitely number two. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, how is it number two? Because it's kind of shrinking the distance between two points by moving the whole fucking universe. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, I, I think, yeah, and then, of course, the reason or the uh, the explanation that they have for it is that they have dark matter as an energy source, which is... Okay, which is everywhere, like, yeah. Well, well, I think in, in their fiction, it's something mm -hmm. along the lines of like entire planets and suns that have collapsed into something that is so incredibly oh, okay. dense that it can be used as essentially coal. And that's yeah. the that's the explanation that they that they have for it. So, yeah, so that, that's an easy one. Um, yeah. And the problem with hyperspace, though, is like, uh, does it exist? And the energy required to like get there is also insane. I feel um, like if we're going to be entering hyperspace, then that yeah. is literally entering the same space as something like HP Lovecraft's inspired yes. from beyond where you're like, you can enter, you know, like subspace or hyperspace, but you don't come back the same, you know, or alternatively, we can kind of look at it. Like I was exactly, that's exactly yeah. what I was going to suggest is Event Horizon where it's like, Hell yeah, you could, but also no, you don't want to, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the last one, which is a rarer and not as fun, is kind of like using quantum mechanics as you're out. So but all really quantum mechanics is, is there's there's the world, the big world of stuff that we're used to, and then there's a tiny world of stuff that we can't see, so like smaller than particle kind of situation, and there's different rules there. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. it's, it's like fiddling with that to make your solution work. Um, the popular example tends to be the quantum entanglement situation. Mm. Which is just like if you have two systems or like two particles that haven't been observed, um, they they share um, correlated values. So like if you observe one and you know something about that particle, then you you know by default that the other correlations are the other one. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with this is it's more just of an identity sort of thing. It's not really uh, meaningful for communication. In fact, you can't communicate that way between the two. Um, correlation to two systems but you know if you ignore that you can do fun fictional things gotcha all right and that's it those are the five key drives i think if you anything we come up with would probably fit into one of those mm -hmm. i'm sure i'm sure that's the case so mm -hmm. because you gave us this primer which i very much appreciate especially yes, as someone who's not as familiar with like sci-fi concepts and uh, like i said I'm mostly a fantasy guy because I, it requires less homework of me. But my yeah. question, of course, becomes to you, Tenet. What is your Tenet, sir? Um, I'm going to go with a classic, since the Dune movie came out recently, a classic Dune answer. Um, whatever the mechanism for faster than light travel is, it involves a rare resources resource that either can be depleted or is a little understood. So mm -hmm. similarly... Uh, I, I'm going to immediately jump in because that is way too similar to what I have um, because <laughs> I am aware that Dune came out um, and I have not seen it yet, but uh, I kind of wanted to take a little bit of uh, idea from it. My concept is that whatever organization, you know, is traveling at faster than light, they haven't unearthed the technology to do so yet but they have found creatures that can travel faster than light. And so they Ooh. use these massive creatures as vessels to travel to, uh, you know, far off and unknown reaches of the universe. Hmm. That's cool. I like that. Nice. So instead of, you know, like I, I think in Dune, it's spice that allows for, you know, the, mm -hmm. the travel, correct? Yes. Yeah, so in, in my concept, I just want it to be something like the worms. Like the worms are the yeah. vessels. Like you're literally riding worms across the universe in, you know, fractions of seconds, essentially. That's Ooh, the concept that I want to go with. Yeah. 
if we squared that, could we say that like there's a resource that attracts these creatures that you could feed them to be able to ride them, and that's what's mm. rare in supply? Like a carrot mm-hmm. on a stick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something that attracts them, kind of like because the spice Absolutely. the worms make spice, but we could like have something right. to feed them. Mm-hmm. You you can you and, and mind you, I don't want them to be worms because that's kind of been done, but I think that yeah. like there is something that this organization has that can attract them. And then once they attract yes. them, they can kind of make them uh, mollify. Like they can kind of control them a little bit more. So that's mm-hmm. the general concept. Like I was thinking of uh, the Pony Express and how I can make that a literal space thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, you just got space horses, right? And that's basically what we're <laughs> doing here. But they're just moving, you know, faster than light. That's all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that too, because you can you can get around a lot of the explanations you could, you could say, for example, these creatures always have traveled faster than light. And so it's a matter of getting yes. on them. We're not actually accelerating, you know, you can mm-hmm. explain it away by making them hyper higher dimensional. There's a lot of options. Mm-hmm. And and I think yeah. you would even mention something along the lines of like tachyons that are, you know, like, yes. what, what was the, what, what did you suggest that they so were like already... tachyons are hypothetical particles that have no mass and always travel faster right. than light. And they're going backwards in time. So these could be like tachyonic creatures. Right. And we, and I think that's kind of a cool concept as well is that mm-hmm. they're, you know, already traveling faster at the speed of light. And it's just the way that we interact with them is unique or interesting in some certain way. So, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Courtney, we've yes. got weird space horses, perhaps, that are attracted by weird space carrots. Can you give this organization a little bit more shape? Maybe. Um, actually, funnily <laughs> enough, <laughs> when you when you brought up, you know, these hyperdimensional beings that we don't quite fully understand, I thought back to the space whales that we had done, like, oh, yeah. Ago, um, and how those were kind of like these weird higher dimensional things that sort of flitted out in and out of um, reality. Um, so just just pictured, you know, riding space whales into the into the far off abyss Same. of space. um but actually one of my tenets was about uh way stations kind of along Mm. the way to various things and i'm wondering if um because when i when i came up with the idea i was thinking of you know ftl travel but without ftl communication um and if there were like way stations that maybe ships would have to stop at to get more fuel or uh, perform maintenance or even like readjust their their trajectory mm. based on where they ended up um, but maybe these way stations are actually areas that have whatever that resource um, that our mm. potential space whales uh, like to eat so th- we're sort of like luring them <laughs> we're sort of luring them along these like predefined tracks um, with their food oh. in a way I, I think that you could also maybe even call them migratory patterns as well if mm-hmm. you wanted to really mm-hmm. lean into the biological aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it automatically solves the problem of, of – because I mean, one of the tenants' requirements was no or difficult um, FTL communication. Like, we mm-hmm. don't have it. All we have is the ability to get on these fucking whales and be transported <laughs> physically. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I assume then- for whatever reason, maybe, you know, if you try to send – radio signals or signals at the whales they just kind of get disrupted and you have to physically Mm. get on them yes i like that concept a lot and what i think it would be rather interesting is again like we the the people that we're talking about here simply do not have the technology you know it's Mm -hmm. it's a matter of we might be 100 years or 200 years in the future where from where we are now and our only and we suddenly stumble upon these creatures and we're like wait a minute we know what to do, yeah. but then we don't know how to get how? back. Like, yeah, like <laughs> how it works, right? Like we know that we can attach ourselves to them, like some kind of like a carriage or something mm-hmm. like that, but we mm-hmm. don't know how to like, okay, I'm going to attach this to the whale thing and then it's going to go. And then like, well, we don't have anyone to make sure that it comes back. Like how do we, you know, like there's, that's the mm-hmm. kind of thing that I'm interested in talking about here where mm-hmm. we have an adventurous kind of like weird oh man sorry i'm getting excited here but like yeah i love the idea that like this is what we're going into here where it's like we're able to communicate between people and everything like that but there's no but like you have to do it in person there's no internet motherfucker Mm -hmm. like go touch Mm -hmm. grass for real you know like that's how it's gonna work is there um 
Is there a though did we did we did we build the way stations or were they already there? Um it could go either way, I guess. Um mm. I wonder if we if you know whoever decided to hop on one of these space whale things um just That's wound awesome. up naturally like where they would migrate oh. to, like Rob was saying, and then we built something around that. Maybe um, there was like something there we built on top of it. So it'd be cool if mm -hmm. these patterns have been along for a long time. There was probably yeah. a previous civilization that had something at the way stations. Yes, yes, definitely. They'll be fixed or turned on. Mm -hmm. mm. There, there could also just be like these are food sources for them. So like, yeah. you yeah. know, like the like I, I was kind of joking about the carrot on a stick thing earlier, but maybe they are like just searching for these way stations that are just constantly fed food, or maybe they're mm -hmm. maybe. Maybe this organization is actively taking charge of making sure that these are way stations. So it's like, here, there's plenty of food in this area to make sure that you have some way station that you can kind of go for, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe it like drifts by a couple of million miles every now and then <laughs> because they don't quite get back in time to the way station before like, the, okay, well, we, we got to. We, the, it moved a couple million miles because we just didn't have the time to get the food source there. I'm sorry. All right. You know, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the way station move. Like there. Potentially, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But, but, but I'm open to, I'm open to other ideas as well. I love both concepts that they can be migratory patterns. They can, or we can just cheap out and say that we have a mix of both where what, there are food sources and there are migratory patterns. And then actually that might be a more interesting pathway anyway, because then we can have fixed points that you can rely on mm -hmm. and other points that you can't rely on. And there's a little bit more danger and a little bit more wild exactly. west attitude to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. maybe the yeah. way you solve that is like, perhaps when we found the way station, we realized that this was a fixed point that had that resource in it, like a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they always travel there. But then we realized we can get this resource and D divert their migratory patterns mm -hmm. yes absolutely. so like if we if we have it it's like let's say you're in a neighboring system you you hitched a ride on a on a whale arrived <laughs> in some system and you hopped off but you're going to collect resources in that area that resource then you know you can attract them back to get back mm. Mm -hmm. because the problem we've created here is that like if you get off that whale you're fucked and once they come back there's no <laughs> way you can come back Basically. yeah Pretty, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of the thing. Or you're like waiting for the next whale to mm -hmm. go in the opposite direction. So it's like public <laughs> right. transit, but way worse. You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> for the next like thousand years. You know? Yeah. It's like, well, I might as well build a civilization because the fucking whale's not coming back. <laughs> also question is, is this setting going to be galaxy wide? Is it smaller to a few systems? Like what's our scope? That's a great question. Yeah, I feel like it would make sense to maybe have it clustered around a few systems, but maybe over time it's it's been spreading further out. Like the goal is to go further out and discover more about the galaxy and space and science, mm. but um, they're sort of in the process of expanding, which brings also what Rob said about like the Wild West frontier kind of vibe to it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the question becomes like, are these things reliable enough to build you know, planets or outposts for a singular race of people or a singular species of people? Or are these, or is this organization that we're dealing with dealing with multiple species at once? And it may be even comprised of multiple species at once because the, the prompt itself doesn't necessarily mention earth or anything mm -hmm. like that. So we can go mm -hmm. even like wilder with it if that's the case. So there might be something to that where this organization that we're dealing with not only plays a role of intergalactic or inter whatever, uh, you know, like couriers, but also maybe there's a lot of diplomacy wrapped up in their ability to travel. And maybe they're the only ones who can. I'm just mm -hmm. throwing concepts out there. I want to hear from you guys. Two thoughts. One, what if the resource was not a thing, but a, but, but a, but a people? Two, what if the, um, instead of restricting it, because we, we've done interstellar and stellar systems and galactic systems, what if we do like intergalactic for once? So like mm -hmm. these migratory patterns take you between galaxies, which are millions of light years apart. Yeah. I'm down for that. Yeah. That could be yeah, like I, super wild west yeah. in the sense that like you could end up someplace really fucking far from home. Mm-hmm. 
like, yeah, I mean, then, then we can go into Star Trek territory, right? Where it's like you're kind of exploring in certain areas. Yeah, and you'd have the aliens you're talking about. Like, you, if you end up in another galaxy, mm-hmm. you might end up with, like, some really weird neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, or just 17 variations of forehead ridges. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of, like, the resources as people, it would it would be maybe people or a living thing is some sort of resource that, that you can find that attracts them. Like, maybe what's at these way stations, mm-hmm. there's some kind of being or beings and that's why they're few in number right that i'm I'm kind of curious about that concept because are you suggesting that the thing that these whales are feeding on are other races or other peoples it could i don't know if it's if it's feeding then maybe you know maybe they're like the riders like maybe the riders are the resource like if you at the way station there's a I mean, i can see i could see a, a story where like the way stations have these entombed writers and they mm-hmm. go there and they're attracted to them in some way, or maybe you can wild west kidnap a writer and that's how you attract a whale to you. I think that'd be interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay. So you're the, the trope that I'm, I'm wary of here is this creates a potential chosen one situation. And yeah, I don't want that, that is something. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. That's something that I'm yeah. not really interested in exploring here in this mm-hmm. type of situation. So um, what, what can we do about that? They could be a race of people. Um, I'm kind of getting like Prometheus vibes, um, mm. with like an ancient race that maybe it was some sort of progenitor race that, um, maybe had tamed these whales at some point mm-hmm. and like something about their, their energy still persists, even though the race has died out. Oh, and it could saturate others. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm also thinking yeah. one of the the because you said Wild West. One of the things that's making me think of this too is like damsel in distress being captured on the railroad tracks, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I know that the damsel in the distress doesn't technically make the train come, but <laughs> it, like conceptually, I think that's fun. Like, if the damsel wasn't there, would the train come? Who knows? Exactly. You can never answer that question. <laughs> I, I can assure you that trains don't care if damsels are on the tracks. Like they're on a schedule, you guys. That's how trains uh-huh. work. But I, I do see what you mean. Like I, I could even see there be some kind of like religious aspect to it in a way where it's like you need a sacrificial virgin to like kind of like dangle in front of or something like that. Or maybe there's a specific psychic signature that they are attracted mm-hmm. to that only occurs in certain things. But Obviously, yeah. you can't yeah. feed that psychic signature to right because then they'll die. <laughs> right, and that's terrible to do. Right, <laughs> I'm uh, just I'm just but- trying to avoid the situation of like we have this resource that they can collect to divert them. I don't want it to just be like, oh, it's dark matter, or oh, it's some element X. You know, like that's boring. You know, right. Yeah. right. What if what if instead of like a an actual food source um, or that type of resource, what if it's more about like comfort, like um, mm. like the whales or whatever feed on something else or somehow survive, but they're drawn to living beings because they sort of absorb um, ambient psychic energy, like you were saying, Rob, but they don't like eat it. They just sort of bask in the warmth of it. And could they help direct the direction of the migratory pattern? Like they interface Mm. with the alien in some way and help emotionally move it. So I I love that concept. I love the idea of like a psychic emanation that is, Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not even about feeding. Maybe it is about drugs. Maybe it's like mm-hmm. they're they're like they get like a contact high from being around some kind of particular psychic emanation, and they're just like, yeah, this is dope. Like I just really like. <laughs> I'm thinking of um, how this feels. You know, I'm thinking of the dolphins that will like purposefully go for. I think it's certain types of puffer fish or something that have some kind of drug-like oh. toxin and they'll just like jab themselves on them <laughs> and like get high off of it yeah i mean people have been licking poisonous toads for centuries so i can i can <laughs> see that these are basically the same thing right where these giant space whales are like yo let's go get high as fuck on those things right over there um it's also yeah. like a horse maiden sort of deal like some horses that really like certain trainers you know Mm, yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah maybe maybe it's like a, a fairly unique thing where you kind of have to like it's it's literally about sinking your wavelength with another giant whale thing mm-hmm. 
And mm. there, okay, there's got to be something to this though, where it's got to be. They're the postmen. What do you mean? Okay, hold on. Explain. Go ahead. <laughs> they're the. We had to bring postal. Okay, so and it, this will lead into my second tenant, but they're they've got to be the postmen, right? If they're somehow able to direct or I don't know, calm or attract the um these creatures, and these creatures are the only way to deliver messages, then they must be the postmen, right? Right, but yeah, the, yeah. but but the hold on, but the the concept is you're attracting these creatures, and then you're mm-hmm. entering a ship, and then kind of going with them. You're not necessarily like, I, I don't know. Well, well, maybe <sighs> maybe they can direct them through different patterns. Like if they, let's say there's like a bunch of patterns, right, and they tend to travel somewhat arbitrarily through them, you know, with with regularity. Maybe the postman can kind of shift that a little bit. Maybe the people who are able to manipulate these giant whales are psychics. And yeah. mm-hmm. the ones mm-hmm. who have the gift for psychic, you know, powers are the ones who are able to control and move them. And yeah, maybe that's the whales, think. yeah, maybe the, the whales are like attracted to people in general because they like they dig their vibes and vibrations, man. <laughs> but like the psychics are the only one who can reach out and mm-hmm. grab the reins and be like, okay. You like this vibe. I like this vibe. Let's go. And then so that way, what like you were saying earlier, Daniel, there's like a horse rider and like a a there's a bond between the two. So it's not like strictly manipulative one way or the other. Like I, yeah. I think that might work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then it would also allow you to like kidnap a, a postman and like yeah. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. To your advantage. Yeah. This is kind or, of giving or me even a... just be an evil kind of person anyway it's like yeah i'm gonna fucking go take this space whale out to pasture or some shit like that right or to my secret bad guy lair that's you only other postmen can get to you know Ooh, i like that Mm -hmm. yeah i'm getting kind of um dragon riders of pern vibes with this because Mm -hmm. in the in those books it was like the the rider became basically psychically connected with their dragon um and it was also shown in like a, a prequel book in the series that the dragons had originally been like genetically modified organisms, essentially. Um, so a lot of connections there. Yeah. Is is that the Aragon or Aragon? No, no, no. Okay, no. Okay, very I different. I think. Yeah, that one's terrible. <laughs> this one's. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm unfamiliar with dragon riders, so yeah, that's uh, okay. okay. I I grew up reading a lot of those books. They were fun. Yeah. Um, I, I should, should I check them out or is it a thing that it's like, you're good. You don't need to worry about that anymore. I'd say it's, it's worth reading. Might yeah. as well try it out. Yeah. yeah. It was like Anne McCaffrey, okay. I think. Yeah. Anne McCaffrey. Gotcha. That reminds me of what's I, the, the darkest rising. Like that one, it's kind of similar world, not I world, but similar vein of writing. Hmm. I recently, um, started reading one of the, the first Malazan book. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely tell that fantasy and like genre fiction has really come a long way because I really struggled to get into Malazan. And I know that Daniel, you were talking about how Dune desperately needs an editor. And <laughs> <Yes>. it's like, <laughs> I I feel like I've probably, I, I'm perhaps a little bit too uh, used to the modern conveniences of genre fiction where it's like, wow, this is really cleanly edited. Wow, this is uh-huh. a clear concept. Mm-hmm. I'm not just tossed into something and told swim or die, motherfucker. You know, like it's kind <laughs> of like, and it's like, I think that there is a certain joy in experience something so new and out of your element. But at the same time, I think there's a way to do that that is also accessible that you don't see in a lot of the old school genre fiction stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, they're also like a product of their time, right? Like, what, what oh, yeah. decade is Malazan? I think it's 80s. The no, actually, it's the um, 60s, right? So, like, Malazan one, started in 99, actually. 99. It oh, wow. Started in 99? Wow. Well, yeah. fuck me then. Like, that is. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, even, it, it even like 2000, a lot that's 20 years, right? Like, yeah. We're talking a 20 yeah. year time difference. Yeah. That's true. Sh- is that Daniel, crazy? Shut up. Shut up, Daniel. <laughs> Don't remind us of our... Don't uh, remind us that we're ancient. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is, like, even with the 99, I would say, like, there's probably, you know, not a lot, but it's probably, like, tropes and stuff that were solidified by those texts that now we 
look back mm-hmm. on it as like, oh, that's boring or we, or we've done it before. But it's because they did it first, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe I'm yeah. just not vibing with Malazan. Like I like older yeah. like kind of fantasy fiction. Like I like um, oh. like the Black Company comes to mind where that feels like a really well done version of what Malazan is trying to do. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I literally am. Oh, I'm only, I'm like a hundred pages in. I need to get oh, yeah. a little bit more time. Not to invalidate right. what you're saying. Like Malazan very well may be crap. I'm just, I'm just saying like <laughs> part of the crappy part might be that it's from a weird decade, you know? That's true. That's very true. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, we were talking about space cowboys, I believe. Um, yes. Or is, mm-hmm. so who has a tenant left? Because I know I still have mine. Courtney, have you given us a second tenant yet? No, not yet. And um, I'm curious how this is going to work now that we've kind of developed things further. Um, so mine was to explain why there can't be FTL communication mm-hmm. and that there was so- some sort of event long ago, like millions or billions of years even, um, that created some sort of like strange dust or radiation that interferes with the communication. Um, and in my tenant, I had the thought that there have been like experiments to try to clean it up or destroy it in some way Mm. to bypass it, but none have been successful so far. Um, So thinking with the whales, maybe, maybe the whales are even like carving paths through Mm. whatever this dust radiation is um, as they travel and migrate Mm -hmm. sort of making like roads and routes within space. I feel like, go ahead, Daniel. I was going to say, it would seem, too, that the whales travel in a different kind of space, right? Either a yeah. hyperspace True, yeah. or a subspace, yeah. right? So I imagine probably what that event must have happened in that space, mm. creating, like, so much disruption or dust, like you said, that unless you're on a ride or on a whale, like, you can't you transmit information mm. or people through mm. it. I bet if you, if you get off the whale while it's traveling, you probably destroy it into that yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. Maybe may, there, there's also another concept we might want to run with here, which is, Maybe the dust itself is dampening our psychic abilities. And so mm-hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. a matter of where there is less dust, there is more psychic ability and thus more mailmen, as we're calling them, right? Where mm-hmm. there's more ability to interact with these creatures and the dust is merely the static getting in the way of us attain it. I mean, if we want to go full conspiratorial, like <laughs> this is like, you know, us finally uncalcifying our pineal gland for the first time. And the <laughs> dust is responsible, you know, that kind of thing. I could see um, maybe there was some kind of higher dimensional warfare. And so mm-hmm. this dust like creates, like we were saying, a really difficult space that the whales can travel through, but that, you know, you, if you try to disembark or move through it normally, you would be destroyed and messages can't be sent. But like yeah. Rob is saying, maybe since it's hyper dimensional warfare, it can affect our lesser dimensional space because, mm-hmm. you know, it, it permeates. So maybe yeah. like it does have an effect on our ability to develop psychic power, you know, that can affect the whales. I like that That's, a lot. Yeah. yeah. As, as a weapon, especially, you're also guaranteeing that whatever race is on that lower plane of existence basically can't rise to the level that can threaten you. So it, it's mm-hmm. also a means of control as a weapon. So that's not a bad idea either, Daniel. Mm-hmm. It's also uh, reminds me of Voyager and the Omega Particle. I'm, I'm sure what that is- people will appreciate that reference. <laughs> what is the Omega Particle, Daniel? <laughs> in, in Voyager, the there is this particle, part of- Courtney. It's the final <laughs> It's real yeah. dumb, but because, <laughs> you know, it's weird, but, uh, and I, I like weird, but <laughs> so it's this particle that the Borg are obsessed with because it's a perfect particle, but it also has, it's mm-hmm. highly unstable. And if you fuck it up, it destroys parts of warp space. Like it literally makes it impossible to use warp in certain regions of space. Okay. Hmm. So now I'm thinking because, um, it, I, I'm sure it's just like the conceit of the language here, but Dark Side from DC Comics has an obsession with the Omega uh, equation, I believe it's oh. called. And it's very similar to the Omega particle that you're describing. And I'm like, so who stole from who here? I'm pretty <laughs> sure that at least in this regard, DC came up with it first, but who knows, you know? Like. I mean, it's such a cool concept in a sci-fi because, like, what's the most valuable thing to damage? And it would literally be the ability to travel through space. If you mm-hmm. destroy the ability to use warp, then good luck. You've, you've now sectioned off portions of the galaxy that you can never get to. 
essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like I said, like, like I said before, as a weapon, it's a great means of control as well. You yeah. know, like what does the nuclear bomb do more than anything else? It is not d a destructive weapon. It is actually a peacekeeping weapon. The, the fact that mm -hmm. we have it means that more peace occurs because no one wants to enter into that type of combat or warfare. Yeah. And ours is more interesting because mm -hmm. like it's it's like preventing you from developing the tools that are necessary to interact with the right. thing that is already traveling faster than mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's it's like if we so in like a really dumb way it's almost <laughs> like we as humans de de created a weapon that caused like lower life forms the inability to create to grow thumbs so it's yeah like, it's like a genetic <laughs> virus. Yeah, yeah, it's like you can't use tools, therefore your society will never again to evolve into something <laughs> mm -hmm. that will threaten us, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's really That's so eugenic yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so whatever space genetics. Yeah, whatever space being that Courtney has created here with this like very specific virus slash weapon <laughs> is like kind of a cool concept. So great job, Courtney. Thanks. Um, totally unintentional. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, have you given your second tenant yet? Um, I have it, and this one's pretty simple and works with what we already have. Um, I was I had written the postal carriers are few in number for reasons that can't be overcome mm -hmm. technologically, and so they're well regarded or highly valued. I mean mm -hmm. that that really works very simply. <laughs> yeah. in. they're yeah. psychics. Yeah. We get it. Okay, we can mm -hmm. keep it moving. <laughs> uh, so this one works with what we're going for, although I think it's a rather interesting concept uh, because it's my tenant. Uh, which is the credo of the organization isn't about accruing wealth or power. It's about providing a service and helping people. There is no money. That. Yeah. There is no money or power to be gained from the service they provide. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did you, do you guys see cheers? Cause I, this is related. I promise. No. Um, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so in in Cheers, um, the one of the characters' name is Cliff Clavin, and he's a Cliff Clavin, and he's um, a postal carrier. He's like I know, so I know Cliff, yeah, right. Don't you worry. I know Cliff. Yeah, <laughs> he's so annoying. But the one thing about him is that he's obsessed with the postal service, and he views it as like this noble, dignified calling. And so that's what that reminds mm -hmm. me of, which is great. He's also an alcoholic, but yeah, <laughs> they're all alcoholics. <laughs> no, that's not true. Jack and Diane also, also uh, like this is straight up boomer talk because we're talking about yeah. a fucking sitcom from the like, eighties. <laughs> <80s and 40. laughs> like, yeah, true, like, no Diane one wasn't cares an about alcoholic. Cheers, but she's a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Well, was and, and was Fraser was Fraser an alcoholic? Or was he just the looking to lot. get away from his terrible life? <laughs> I think that's yeah. great. I would, that's I would say, though, they're all borderline he's, alcoholics. He's <laughs> Except he's for close. Sam. He was yeah. an alcoholic. I would agree with that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, Old Guy Corner is now over. Uh, we're going to get back into our space <laughs> win. I, no, I, I love guess. that concept because it's very utopian. It makes you think of Star Trek, which is great. You know, it's, it's a departure mm -hmm. from, like, the Pony Express, but it also kind of makes you think of the Wild West because... I'm seeing them as having this noble duty to provide the service, you know? Yeah. And, and I didn't, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you could also take it in a religious direction, but I also like the idea that I want to stay away from that partially mm -hmm. because I think that maybe the idea is when you awaken these psychic powers within yourself, you can kind of gain a, a higher level of consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you start to recognize that it's more about the whole rather than the self. And so that's where oh, I like that. That kind of comes in, yeah. What I, what I really like about that is it, it puts it in more of a, a humanistic perspective, you know, in the vein of Star Trek rather than a religious one, which is which is easy mm -hmm. to do, but it's been done a lot in sci-fi. You know, it mm -hmm. takes us back to Dune. So it's yeah. cool to do that. Right, and, that's, and that is something that I am wary of. Like, I, I do kind of want to stay away from that colonial slash uh, imperialistic type of religious aspect to it, you know, like... That's why I wanted to be like, yo, everyone's cool and happy about themselves, man. You know. Anyway, um, I feel like we've gotten through all of our tenets, and this is already a longish episode, and I'm actually very excited about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we were supposed to specifically stick to the organization, but it's like you have to understand so much about the rest of the world and the universe that we're talking about here. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. All right. So. We have 
our tenets out of the way. And with that, we're now going to create the world anchor, which is something that is specifically related or hold on something that is important about the world. And because we're focusing more on an organization this time, I think that whatever we create has to be directly tied into the postmen slash mailmen slash whatever organization mm -hmm. that we've created so far. So without further ado, let's roll a theme. The theme that we're going to be rolling with is fury. Very interesting already. And the Weird. thing, the <laughs> anchor itself that we're going to be focusing on is an historic event. All right. So it's a, it's an historic event. The theme is Fury. We're specifically focused on the organization itself. The obvious answer is to go with its founding. I'd like to ignore that and then maybe mm. figure out something else that's related. Yeah? Yeah. That works, yeah. I think if it's connected to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Fury. Uh, that is an interesting one. Uh, I'm thinking. I really so like your idea you had about the evil writer. Evil mailman. Mm -hmm. He's probably really furious. <laughs> <laughs> One would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for some reason. Yeah. Well, I mean, what what can stoke anger on such a level that it creates or causes an historic event? You know, like especially if we're focusing on just the writer, the specific evil writer themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, so if he's a if he's a mailman, that must mean at some point he cared about the duty of the service and he believed in the organization. So I can imagine a grievous slight being either his his belief being betrayed or subverted in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of um like if he was asked to deliver something that ended up causing a disaster. Oh, um, I like that. Yeah. Partially tying back to like Fallout New Vegas, where your your character is a courier. And um, you're asked to deliver something, but it turns out that that something has a lot of power behind it and can do some pretty serious things. And I think that could lead to a lot of a lot of feel if it's like a big enough betrayal, it's, you know, a lot of anger and uh, distrust can come out of that. I love that. I like that yeah. a lot. Uh, I think we can take that a step further and maybe it's a betrayal by the person who is or. Maybe it's a betrayal by the organization or the people who charged them with something. And as a result, maybe this evil mailman, as we're calling them, was isolated and, and stranded for an extended mm. period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then obviously when you're, when you're isolated and, and stranded and you're betrayed like that, you start to feel this fury start to fester within you and maybe it twists oh, so, you in some, in some mm -hmm. way. Like a Rathacon situation, like he was he was knocked off of his rider at some point and stranded in space for a long time. So that's what festered, created the fury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then- I can see that. Yeah. Okay, so what's the historic event and how does it relate specifically to- the organization that we've created here. We don't have a um, a real um, adversary or villain. Um, in the beginning, we were talking, we hadn't really developed the organization. We had like a company that was collecting a resource and might have had nefarious purposes. So like, I guess the question is like, what's, is it the organization itself that has a bad seed in it? You know, that, that mm. he was a tool in, in this? Um, or is it external to that? That would be a first question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the I think the ideal that I had in mind as well is that they're not just couriers; they're also like diplomats in a way, in some kind of in some senses, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. something that I would like to explore a little bit as well, especially if they're yeah. more on the altruistic and you know humanist side of things, where mm -hmm. they want to stitch everyone together. Maybe this event itself in the historic event that happened is related to the creation of a villain you know like maybe that's the historic event that that um, caused con to happen and so mm -hmm. i don't know i, I think are there's they, something to this here 
like you say, like I think you say that that um, they've got a diplomatic ban. It would make sense because if this organization is intergalactic, right? I mm-hmm. imagine the postmen are being contributed from different civilizations, so there must be like an uh, inter federation sort of situation mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they're different aliens that are different postmen, but they're all part of this 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 universal organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there might be something to this is the creation of an evil emperor type situation. I'm not sure how I I like that idea because when you think about it, right, what's the most dangerous thing in, in this particular setting is the ability to travel and then use that for warfare. And mm. because the rest of the mailmen are kind of like bound and agree that they shouldn't be doing that, the thing that makes that rogue mailman, the one who's been twisted by fury and hatred is the ability he's like I can use this for evil. I can use this space travel to go and essentially uh pillage at will, to, you know, like oh, I need resources for something. Great, I'm going to go to this underdeveloped planet, you know, essentially drain it dry and then that's going to feed this empire that I have over here. And because he's the one who and because he's one of the few people who has control over these space whales or whatever where you know like the the faster than light animals that's a huge that's like that is a huge advantage to have you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean and what was the i guess the one thing i don't want to lose is what was the betrayal like what was the thing maybe something happened inside of the organization that got him stranded and so he started creating this maybe his own mailman he's creating mm-hmm. in the time he was stranded i could see him mm-hmm. be stranded and then wherever he was stranded he raises that that civilization or that planet, he teaches them the ways of the mailman to make more mm-hmm. so they can get his revenge. But I wonder, like, because Courtney said he ferried something unsavory, like what was the International Mailman Federation? Like, what were they ferrying and why was it so awful that they had to saddle him with it? Well, Daniel, I feel like that's a great question that a twist could potentially mm-hmm. answer. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that we're going to stop right there. We're going to roll a twist and we're going to see where that takes us. So let's roll some dice. Oh, I I don't know if I want to do this one. Uh, What is it? It's reverse the roles of the heroes and villains. Hmm. Oh, I like that. I think it could work. I mean, yeah, we could still, the the organization itself could still be good, but there could be bad apples that make them the villains. Mm -hmm. So, but right. But in specific context of this, this rogue um this uh-huh. rogue mailman maybe okay you know what you know what <laughs> i'm okay with, rolling with this twist we can make this yeah. happen we can make yeah. this work for sure to make it uh, work moment guys <laughs> oh my god okay thank you tim gunn yes <laughs> all right so that'll do it for this episode of world build with us we're going with that twist the twist was reverse the roles of the heroes and villains uh and with that We'll close out this episode of World Build with us. A big thank you again to Commissar Whiskers for submitting this prompt. And remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com. Click on the button and we will build your world within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, If you want to follow us on social media, you can go to our Twitter and follow us at Let's World Build. If you want to come join our Discord community, or if you're feeling particularly generous and you want to give us money over on Patreon, you'll find the link for both of those in the description of this very episode. That'll do it for this episode of World Build with us. Remember that we love you very much, and we're going to get through this together until next week.